Hello, friends and family. Welcome to Atmosphere Church. We're so happy you've joined us today. We are called to impact our communities and our social spheres through Christ in us. If you haven't done so, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this message with friends and family. Get ready to see Jesus work in you and through you. To it. Today's message is called How to Wait on the Lord. Okay? How to wait on the Lord. Man, Pastor, I wanted you to preach about acceleration, about cutting down the wait time, about how, you know, we're supposed to cast out the spirit of delay and then things come immediately. I want, I'm here to tell you, we're not here to sugarcoat the gospel. We're here to tell you that a lot of the time there's waiting. Someone say waiting. A lot of the time there is waiting in our lives. And we wait and we wait and we wait for the breakthrough, for the blessing, for the answer. And sometimes we feel frustrated because we're like, God, well, where are you? You know, I'm waiting. I've been praying. I really need this in my life right now, not tomorrow. I need it right now, God. And why don't I have it? And so we get frustrated. Perhaps we're, we're questioning ourselves saying, well, maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe God doesn't hear me the way that he hears other people. You know, maybe God doesn't have the same favor and treatment in my life than he does to other people's lives. Maybe you're looking on Instagram and you see people, you know, having thousands and thousands of followers and you've been trying and at it on your own account and you're like, hey, I don't see anything. Maybe you see your a neighbor business doing the same exact thing as you and they're multiplying in their business and you look at yourself and saying, man, what's going on here? Am I the only one? Or are there others here who can relate to what I'm trying to say here? We're all in a process of waiting. And sometimes we can get frustrated and, and have that sense of impatience. But I want to speak to you today of how God tells us how we should wait. And how does waiting look like in the Bible? Are you ready? Let's go to the book of Psalms 27 verse 14. So once again, the book of Psalms 27 Verse 14. And if you don't have your Bibles with you, you can follow along on the screen with us. And look at what it says. It says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Since it's so short, let's go through it again. All right? Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. God's word for you today is wait for him. Wait for him because he's going to do it. If it's going to be, if it's a blessing that comes from God, he's the one that's going to act. He's the one that's going to work on our behalf. Okay, so we must wait on the Lord. And you're not alone in waiting. I mean, in the Bible, we see that in different people in the scripture. We see, uh, for example, Abraham. We know that Abraham God gave him a prophecy. God gave him a promise and he said, Abraham, you're going to be, have a son. And through that son, that seed, there's going to be a blessing of many nations. I'm going to multiply your generations. And Abraham received that with all his heart. And he says, wow, God gave me a promise. But let me tell you something. In between the promise and the fulfillment, there was 25 years. And some of us have only been waiting for a month. Two months. Man, no, from the promise, from the prophetic word of God till the fulfillment, there was 25 years. King David as well, before he became a king, he went from being David, waiting 15 years, and then he became king. Not only that, but we see people in the, in the Bible, Rebecca waited 20 years to give birth to uh, her children, Jacob and Esau. So we see in the Bible that people have been waiting for a long time. Is it that God's just, you know, trying to tease us and says, let's see how, you know, let, let's see how he reacts. Let, let me punish this guy. Let me tell you something. Waiting is not a punishment. Before you shoot me. Waiting is not a punishment. Waiting is a blessing. What do you mean, pastor? Okay, let me tell you. I want to tell you this. The Bible says, wait for the Lord be strong. Right? That's the passage we read. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Sometimes we might miss that because uh, uh, sometimes we don't understand what waiting means in the Bible or maybe to the Hebrew culture. In my study, I saw that the word for wait that is commonly used in the Bible is the word uh, kava. Okay? I hope I'm not butchering the pronunciation, but kava. 
and it means to wait. This is the common word, and that's the, even found in this passage of Psalms 27. It says, wait for the Lord. So, kava for the Lord and be strong. Let me tell you, that word kava is interesting. See, that word, it, it really, in, in the root meaning, it means that there is a binding or braiding, if you may, of, a, of strings to create a rope. That's interesting. So waiting is, is the action of twisting strings together to create a rope. I don't know if you've ever seen a rope that is like a twisted or, or braided, like a cord, right? Um, those cords back in the day, how they would create a strong cord or a strong rope is by getting strands and they would tie them together to create that strong braided rope. And let me tell you something, that in the Bible, that's what waiting means. Waiting does not mean do nothing. Waiting means get strong in your faith in the Lord. There is value in waiting. There is a productive value to the to Hebrews, or sorry, to the Jews. Waiting was a verb, an action word. I'm taking action. I'm not waiting, doing nothing. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God wants you to wait and do nothing. The Bible says wait on the Lord, and it truly requires us to do action. Okay? Now, I want you to, to see this. So it says wait for the Lord and become strong and be strong. That, this is that, that constant twisting and my confidence in the Lord constantly praying constantly seeking the Lord until I see that thing that I'm hoping for come to be in fulfillment I want you to see this so waiting has a purpose you know Jesus when he was with his disciples you know he was walking around his disciples on his final days and he says hey disciples I want you to wait for the Holy Spirit and look at this. And after he ascended, what did the disciples do? Were they just, was there waiting, doing nothing? You know, twiddling their thumbs, just saying, I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. What was their waiting? The Bible says that their waiting was constant gathering, praying, and seeking the Lord. And then on one of those occasions, the Holy Spirit descended. You see, what am I to do while I'm waiting? It's not to do nothing. Waiting and doing nothing are not the same. It's about seeking the Lord until it passes, until it comes to pass. Somebody say amen. amen. There is an action. There is something that we got to do in order for us to wait, biblically speaking. Okay, so I want to give this, um, this analogy. Like, for example, if you just can think about um, a father and a son baking cookies. Okay, a father and son baking cookies. There's a process to that. Um, I've intend, I, I've tried to bake my own cookies, and man, it's a it's a long process. I appreciate the bakers. God bless you, bakers, because man, it's a long process to do it. And so you got to mix in everything, the the flour, the egg, and 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 so you put together all of the ingredients. And not only that, but then you got to cut them out into pieces, put them into the oven, and wait. And to a child, imagine a father and a son, to a son, he's impatient. He's like, but I want the cookies. I want the cookie right now. I want it right now. And the father's like, hey, there's a process to make it. Let me tell you something, that there is a difference between the perspective, or should I say, the desire and delight between the father and a son. The son's desire is, I want the cookie. The father's desire is, let me enjoy baking with you, my son. See, God's intention is sometimes, if I don't have you waiting, you would never seek me. If, if I gave it to you right away, you would never look for me. You would never want to spend time with me. And so sometimes the waiting process is actually a, a blessing in disguise because it encourages us to seek the Lord, to look for him, to spend time with him. And we're braiding that faith until it becomes that rope of hope and faith that we need. Amen. So God sometimes, you know, he, 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 what he delights in is, man, just I, I want to spend time with you. I want to establish a relationship with you. Okay. It is good that he waits sometimes. Uh, uh, this is what uh, in Psalm 27. So remember, we read, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. 
And look at this. Then it says, it is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. How is he supposed to wait? Silently. What does that mean? That means that a lot of us, while we wait, the Bible is saying be silent because sometimes our chatter and our talking becomes complaints that are actually delaying the process. The Bible says be silent because sometimes we begin to, to, to complain and say, but God, you don't listen to me. God, you don't love me. And we begin to maybe look down at ourselves and we begin to say, but maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not giving enough. Maybe I'm not serving enough. And we begin to complain and use our mouth as a curse while God is saying, just be silent and trust in me. Amen. Wait silently for the salvation of the Lord. Okay. Um, I want you to, uh, sorry, Lamentations 3.25, you'll see what I'm talking about. Lamentations 3.25 says, the Lord is good to those who wait for him. Who is he good to? To those who wait for him. To the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. Now I want to say this uh, as well. Waiting, one of the blessings of waiting is that it builds anticipation. Man, if there's no waiting process, you're not going to have this expectations attitude in your heart. But I'm here to tell you that God wants us to develop an expectation because expectation makes us value what he gives to us. More than if we got it right away. Imagine if, uh, if, if you received a blessing right away. You're not going to value it as much as somebody that was praying, interceding, and fighting in the spirit for it. Can you just imagine, there's a, a bigger value to someone who gets something after a long process of waiting. Sometimes in us getting things immediately, we tarnish that moment, right? So I want to tell you, God makes us wait. And watch this, God makes us wait not because the blessing isn't ready, but because we aren't ready for the blessing. Isn't that true? Sometimes the blessing is there and we're saying, God, why are you delaying the blessing? God is like, son, I'm not delaying anything. <laughs> You're delaying it. And see, I, I need you to mature enough to handle that blessing. Because if you're not in the level of maturity to handle that blessing and I give it to you right away, I'm going to damage you. I'm going to hurt you. That blessing will become a curse. You know that? Blessings become curses when we receive them outside of the time of God. It could have been a blessing if it was in the right season, but it became a curse because I got it and I forced it in a season that wasn't right. So I want to tell you that the blessing is not that the blessing isn't ready, but because we aren't ready for the blessing. And we delay and elongate the process of waiting because we're not maturing. You know, one of the beautiful things about the Holy Spirit, one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is called sanctification. And that sanctification process is to develop us to become like Christ. And that is a beautiful thing. So the Holy Spirit comes into our life, sanctifies us, and as he sanctifies us, our character is being built up. And so when we resist the process of maturing, you're resisting the process of the Holy Spirit. And we're delaying that blessing from coming into our life. Okay? Um, I, I want also to, to note this. We need to humble ourselves and trust that God's timing is perfect. I don't know about you, but this is one of the most difficult truths to accept. God, your timing is perfect, even though we need that right now. Like, God, like, I need that blessing, like, right now. But we got to say, God, I surrender in, in humility. I just come to you and say, God, you know what's best. Your timing is perfect, even when it doesn't make sense. Amen? I want to show it to you. So John 11, verse 5. Look, look what it says here. So John 11, verse 5. Okay, this is what's, in, this, this blows my mind. John 11, verse 5. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, which is Mary, and Lazarus. So he loves them three. All three of them. He loves them with all his heart. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. How does that make sense? 
Let me give you context here. I mean, it, the, the Bible just confessed it. Jesus loves these three people. He loves Martha. He loves Lazarus. And he loves Mary. And the thing is that Lazarus was sick and he was dying. And so anyone who is in love with someone, don't you think there's an acceleration? Like my best friend Lazarus is dying? Hold up. Let me pause here and let me go to Lazarus right away. But the Bible says that Jesus loved them so much that he delayed two days. How does that make sense? Let me tell you, God's timing doesn't make sense to us humans. He lives in eternity. We live in this time. To him, a hundred days is like a thousand days, and a thousand days are like one day. God's perception of time is totally different than all of ours. But he has his, pl his plan. He has his purpose. He has his own agenda. He has his own will. And so I got to trust, man, God, you know what you're doing. And in fact, if we see here, is that once Jesus arrives to both Mary and Martha, they begin to say, but Jesus, it's okay, like... If you came maybe a couple days ago, you would have saved Lazarus. But you took your time. Can, can, I, can I ask you something? Well, isn't it interesting that in none of the four Gospels, we never see Jesus running? Right? Isn't that crazy? He's always at his own pace. Not his pace, pace the, the Father's pace. He is waiting and saying, Father, you tell me where to go, when to go, when to do it. I'm waiting on you. And so here we see that Martha and Mary, they were struggling with their faith. They were saying, Jesus, if you love him, why weren't you here a couple of days ago? But Jesus understood there is a greater purpose that you and I don't understand. See, with Lazarus' death, Jesus also knew that there would be a resurrection. And he would say, while you're waiting on me to heal him, I'm actually waiting on God's time to glorify him. Yeah, and in that moment, let me tell you, and in that moment of him arriving to Lazarus, even though it was perceived as late, it was on God's time. And Jesus resurrected Lazarus. And not only Mary and Martha were blessed, but the entire town was blessed. See, we might have to just reflect on ourselves and say, God, maybe if I get this right now, I'm the only one that's going to be blessed right now. But maybe you're waiting for an opportunity where it won't just be a blessing for me, but a blessing for the rest of my family, the rest of my church, the rest of my city. So we don't know God's agenda or God's purpose. But what we must do is trust in his timing. Amen. So uh, another one, I want to tell you, so sometimes we struggle with waiting because maybe our intentions aren't in the right place. Let me tell you, one of those individuals that we can reflect on is a girl named Hannah, okay? A girl named Hannah, and, and, and she was one of two wives of this guy called Elkanah. Yes, polygamy was a thing back then, not today. But Hannah was one of the two wives of this guy called Elkanah, all right? And so the thing is that back in the day, for, for, for a woman, one of her main desires and purposes was to be able to procreate, to give a son or a daughter, to give a child. And so in that time, Hannah was, was desperate. She was saying, I really want a child. I really want a boy. I want a, I want a kid. Please, God, give me a kid. But the Bible says, and look at this, it was God that had closed her womb. It wasn't time yet. But the thing is that all around, I want you to notice this, that the, her, her enemy, okay, so her enemy, which her name is Pe uh, Penaniah, uh, or Penina, sorry, her enemy, she was beginning to mock her and say, hey, look, I have kids and you don't have kids. You're a barren woman and I'm fruitful. See, my husband loves me more. That's why I have kids for him. She was mocking her. And so guess what happened to Hannah? She got more depressed, more sad, more pressured, more, more with anxiety. Can I tell you something? Sometimes your anxiety doesn't come from God. It comes from the pressures of your family telling you, you ought to do this by now. You should have been married by now. Hello? 
You should have kids by now. Why don't you have your home yet? Society already tells you your career should already be at this level by now. You should be making this income by now. There's no more by now. Just begin to focus and trust in the Lord and say, God, I will trust in your timing. And Hannah, that's why she was so stressed out. She kept on listening to the person mocking her, saying, hey, you should have a child right now. Her husband perhaps was putting pressure, give me a child. Society was giving an expectation of her to give a child. But Hannah just said, hold up. I'm stopping all this. Let me consult with the Lord and let his intentions come and, and let me, my life, align to his will and intentions. And when she finally prayed, God, I'm going to surrender my first son to you. And when she said that, then God opened her womb and she was fruitful. Because us humans were waiting for a son, God was waiting for a prophet to be born. For a woman to say, God, on, in your timing, you need a prophet. So now I'm going to bear fruit of what your purpose is and what your will is. So maybe we got to pray, God, align me to your will. Here's something that I want to say to you. So I actually, I remember hearing a preaching from my dad. He was, tell, he was talking about uh, what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. And this was a beautiful preaching uh, that I still remember today because it shifted my idea of how to pray to God. See, a lot of us think that in the name of Jesus is everything we just tag along after our prayer and it will be done. So God, I want this in the name of Jesus. It has to be done. But can I tell you something that that's sometimes the misconception. You know, um, back in the day what it meant to pray for something in the name of somebody, really what it meant is according to that name. According to that, it's not just like, like he's a genie. God, because I prayed in the name of Jesus, it's going to be done. That's not how it is. That's not how it works. It's according to your name. Jesus, what is your will? And everything that I ask according to your will will be done on earth. Maybe I'm not praying according to his will. Maybe I've got to find out, God, what is your will? What is your will? What is your intention? What do you want of my life? What is the purpose that you need from my life? Maybe that's what God is waiting for, to align us to his heart, to align us to his way of thinking. Okay? Now, now let's go back to Hannah for a second. So imagine this lady that was mocking Hannah and saying, Hannah, hey, you haven't... See, you, you still haven't had a child yet. You believe in God. You go to church every single uh, Sunday and you still don't have what you've been asking the Lord. Look at this. I want us to read Proverbs 20, verse 22. This is a promise the Lord wants to give to you today. Proverbs 20, 22. And highlight this one for all your, your, your haters and, you know, all those people that don't like you and have been criticizing you. Look, Proverbs 20, 22. Look at what it says. Do not say, I will repay evil. But what does it say? Wait for the Lord and he will save you. What is your role when you're being mocked? What is your role when you're being criticized? What is your role when you got betrayed? What is your role when everyone's bashing you and talking behind your back and stabbing you in the back? What is your role? It's not to fight back. Actually, he says here, don't say, I will repay evil. Instead, it says, wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Man, that's a, uh, I don't know, that's a word for somebody today. Maybe people have been talking about you. People have been criticizing you. Your role is not to fight back. Your role is not to mock back or to murmur back or criticize back or to judge back. Your role is to simply say, God, I will wait on you. You know, even for the people that perhaps at some point in, in their lives have criticized me, my desire, my role is not to say, God, you're, you're going to avenge me one day. And those people are going to see one day. You're, you're going to see. They, they will one day be, you know, under a curse or something. No, that's never, that shouldn't be in your heart. <laughs> All right, so I always have to repent today. <laughs> but that should never be in your heart to, to call down curses on, on those people that have been criticized. No. Hold up. Instead, just say, God, have your way in that situation. 
I will wait on you. And some of us feel the need to go and justify ourselves, to vindicate ourselves. No, that wasn't me or I didn't say that or whatever. God is saying, just don't worry about it. Let the fruits of your life speak for themselves. Isn't that, man, somebody has to receive that word. Oh, man. It's not me who will repay evil. I must wait for the Lord. And he's going to do it. He's the one who's going to quote unquote avenge us but sometimes that avenging doesn't look like the way that you want it to be you want God to get back at them but could it be that God can restore that life bless them use them man God I leave it in your hands your way is better my mind isn't going to be occupied on what my vengeance is going to be no I will wait on you my redeemer my salvation amen okay so we need to uh, give the Lord all of our matters, everything that we feel. If we feel hurt, give it to the Lord. Give it up to him. Place it at his feet and instead be, pay attention to what he is saying. Okay? Now, I, I want to tell you this. So never, so this is how not to wait. Okay, one of the things not to do is to go outside of God to make it happen. Never go outside of God to make something happen. If you don't see it happening yet, don't go and look for another solution. And let me tell you something. The world offers a lot of microwavable solutions. What you want, you can get it right now in the world. But the microwavable solutions taste like microwave food. But the things of God that are well prepared, well processed, it's going to last. Amen. The world offers things but it's temporary things but the things of the Lord last and they're not momentary but eternal they last okay now I want to I want to also say this waiting and doing nothing remember we said are two different things and can I say sometimes people are you know don't do something in the church or perhaps don't don't serve in the kingdom or not active in the kingdom maybe because they've been waiting for the Lord for, for him to reveal his purpose to them. I've been there. You know, when I've been saying, God, I'm not going to move a finger until you speak to me from heaven and tell me what to do. Right? I don't know if I'm the only one who has ever tried to tell the Lord and just say, God, I don't, I don't know what my purpose is, but until I know my purpose, I'm not going to do anything. Let me tell you something. That's not the right idea, not the right heart. That's not how you wait. See, let me introduce something to you, a concept called the revealed will of God. Say it with me, revealed will of God. Okay, it's, it's God's revealed will. Between me waiting for my purpose or what that hidden will is of God, I need to turn to the revealed will. There is no one that can say, I don't know what God wants me to do in my life. Because it's all revealed in here already. See, some of us are waiting for the word of God when he's already spoken. And let me tell you something, that as we do the things he's asked of us to do, his words start flowing. Things become rama to you. Prophetic words begin to be released. Let me tell you that I didn't find my calling. You know, I, I've shared this before, uh, that, that when, when, when I was starting in my walk with Christ, like truly starting in my walk with Christ, God showed me a vision, but he didn't tell me exactly what I would do. Literally, his vision was I would be one of his five stars. And I had no idea what that meant. But my, uh, my pastor, my dad, explained to me that one day I would be someone in the fivefold ministry. And I was like, okay, cool. Which one? I don't know. When? I don't know. How? I don't know. But God gave me the vision. And so what I had to do is not just wait until God clarifies that with me. Let me share my journey. My journey was that once I received that vision, I understood I need to be processed. I, I'm not going to receive and fulfill that vision right away. I'm going to go through a process in my life. And so I started serving in areas um, that, that perhaps have nothing to do with those five ministries. You know, maybe as an usher, as a leader first, uh, as a connect group leader. And eventually, as I served the Lord, he began to open the way for me. And now to understand that what God meant all along in the beginning was one day you will be a pastor. But from then to, to where I was before, I had to wait. And waiting was a process of action. 
God, I'm going to serve you even, I don't, even if I don't know my purpose yet. I'm going to serve you even though I don't understand it fully yet. But I'm going to serve you with all my heart because you have already have a revealed will. You might be asking, what is the revealed will? Well, let me give you a simple one. It's called the Great Commission. The Great Commission. There is no one in Christianity that should be asking, what should I do as a Christian? It is revealed right there, his revealed will. Jesus said, go out and preach the gospel to all creation, baptizing them and also what? Discipling them. In my life, I ought to be contributing in some shape or form in the Great Commission. Before we leave today, I want you to just make a self-assessment and say, God, am I contributing in the Great Commission while I'm waiting? Or maybe reflect on yourself today, right now, and just say, God, is there any area in my life that is actually part of that commission? You know, are, are you serving? Remember, it's not a judgment, just a self-assessment. It's between you and the Lord, but... God, am I serving so that the Great Commission can happen? Am I giving so that the church can do its Great Commission? Am I, you know, am I preaching the gospel? Is there any area in my life right now that I am doing that is contributing to the Great Commission? Isn't that a good question? And maybe some of us today need to say, I got to wait better. I got to get better at waiting. You know, we're bored waiting because we're doing nothing while we, we wait. Sorry, that was a tongue twister. While we wait. Whoa. <laughs> we're doing nothing while we wait. But what we got to do is that it becomes more exciting to wait as we're doing things for the Lord. Amen. So we should be active in the Great Commission. Okay. The next thing that God wants of us to do is while we're waiting, we need to be faithful. You know, one of, one of the, the most beautiful passages in the Bible, Galatians 5.22, uh, which says, Therefore, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Uh, two of these fruits are important for us to, to look at today. Number one is this, faithfulness. Say that with me, faithfulness. While we wait, we must go into faithfulness. What does faithfulness mean? It means to be loyal to the Lord, not just in my actions, but also in my heart. To be loyal to the Lord when things are good and when things are bad. To be faithful when I have it and when I don't have it. To be faithful when I feel it or don't feel it. To be faithful whether I'm growing or not growing. To be faithful at all times, rain or shine, to be with the Lord. That is what it means to wait on God. Okay, and here's the next one is patience. I want to tell you that uh, patience is, is truly, there's only one way to learn patience. You want to know how? By waiting. And we're all praying, God, give me patience. Well, you asked for it. Lord, give me patience. Well, the only way to learn patience is through waiting. That's the only way. But let me tell you something that's beautiful is that this is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not that I will generate patience on my own. It's that patience is a fruit of the Spirit of God. Faithfulness is a fruit of the Spirit of God. As I surrender, as I seek the Holy Spirit, I will generate those things that are not natural to me. It's not natural for you to be patient, but through the fruit of the Holy Spirit, you can be patient. It's not natural for you to be faithful to God, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can be faithful to God. So what you need is the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I want to I tell you this, uh, this last thing in these last few minutes that I, that I have. I want us to go to James 4, 13, verse 15. So James 4, 13, verse 15. By the way, quick shout out to the sisterhood um, group. You know, they, they've, been, um, they've been reading the Bible together, and it's awesome. I think they just finished uh, the book of James, if I'm not mistaken. Someone correct me. Sorry? James and, well, they're ahead. James and Ephesians. Uh, so that's beautiful. So shout out to them. I mean, if you're saying, hey. If you're saying, I need motivation, I need a group of girls to help me to read the word of God, well, 
that we offer that here in the church. So I, I encourage you to be reading uh, with them, alongside them. So anyways, the reason I mention this is because we're mentioning the verse in James, James 4.13 Look at what it says, come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. Haven't you ever wondered why sometimes people, when they reply, they say, Lord willing? It's actually biblical. <laughs> There's a reason why they say that, Lord willing, like God willing. Because can I tell you something that's scary but at the same time encouraging? That God doesn't promise to you your tomorrow. Tomorrow isn't promised to us. At any time, you know, whether it is the rapture or whether it is something in life, we're not, we're like, like the Bible says, we're like vapor. One day, you know, God forbid, and I mean, this is not for, for, to fall on anyone, but God forbid, imagine a car accident can happen at any moment, a sickness at any moment. So there's many ways that this life can take us out. But let me tell you this, that is why we ought to live with a mentality of God, Lord willing. One of the things that I was struggling with in my life in this season, remember I said that uh, in, the, in the beginning of the preaching, that I was waiting for something since January. It's what, like now four, five months that I've been waiting for something. And in that season of waiting, God was trying to expose in my own life an idol that was hidden for a long time. The idol of control. If I do this, this will happen. 100%. If, if, I, if I send these documents as I planned and everything is structured, everything is good, this will happen right away. But let me tell you something, that that is an idol. The idol of perfectionism. The idol of control. That is the prideful idol where we are prideful. This is what James is saying, that there are some of us who live our life without faith because we have it all figured out. I know that if I, you know, if I work here and budget here and pay these bills, I'm good by the end of the month. You don't live by faith. You live by works. I live by what I plan. I live by what I can do. But, but here James is saying that the attitude that a Christian should have is not tomorrow this is what I'm going to do. It is, it's good to plan, but not to place your entire dependency on your works and your plans. It is to say, God, this is what I plan, but Lord willing if you allow it to be so. That is the attitude of the Christian. I'm always in constant expectation. God, I'm gonna, I wanna do this, but Lord willing, it's your will, God, uh, your plans, it's your timing. And that is the attitude of humility, okay? I love this quote. I actually forgot to write down who said it, but let me take the credit. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Look at what it says. So uh, it, it says, waiting is not just about what I get, at the end of the wait, but about who I become as I wait. Dang. Waiting, is, let, let, me, let me say it again. Waiting is not just about what I get at the end of the, of the wait, but about who I become as I wait. God's ultimate desire is not that you receive the blessing, but that you become a blessing. God's desire isn't just for you to wait for a breakthrough to come into your life, but it's for you to become like Christ. That's the better desire. That's the ultimate desire that God expects. The waiting, the training, the getting discipled is all part of the process so I may become Christ-like. Okay? Amen. Okay? And here's a, a, a last one. What should we do while we wait? Uh, another one is this. Be grateful for what you do have. There's nothing like being ungrateful. See, our attitude perhaps are sometimes, God, I don't have that yet. And so at the same time, I'm going to live my life miserable, complaining, and being ungrateful. But if only you realize that you have it good while waiting. You still have it good. I, I shared this testimony with, uh, with my, my, my disciples um, 
a while back, I, I was telling them that there's power in gratefulness. Uh, I was telling them that it was in a winter time, uh, that big snowfall, I think maybe you guys remember, it's probably engraved in your mind, that big snowfall that came. And man, I had to shovel my, my driveway alone because I'm, I'm, I'm the only one that, that, uh, that, 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 that could do it at the time. And I'm like, oh, snap. I'm like, this is going to require a long time. This is a long process. I'm tired, but let, let's, let's go and do it. I started to shovel, and just this attitude of ungratefulness just came into my heart. And I was just like, man, why? Why did it have to snow? Like, why couldn't it snow little by little? Why, God, did you send all the snow in one time? And I was just huffing, puffing, being upset, and just shoveling. And, and, and then all of a sudden, it, it was like the Holy Spirit just came into me and, and told me, be grateful. And all of a sudden, a reflection came into my mind. And I said, Lord, the reason why I'm shoveling right now is because you gave me a home. Like, that is why. And while I'm complaining, doing something, God is saying, be grateful that you get a chance to do that. And so I started to be grateful. I'm like, thank you, Lord, for this, for this home. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you've given to me. And, and no lie, I'm not even exaggerating, no lie. As soon as my attitude changed of being grateful to the Lord, my neighbor came, and my neighbor who has a, uh, a snowblower, he came and, and he's like, hey, uh, do you need help? <laughs> I'm like, yes, please. So he comes and, and, and quickly he goes and finishes the, the job that, uh, th that was needed. And I'm like, Lord, see, that's what happens when I become grateful. The waiting process just diminishes. Maybe some of us have to just be grateful enough in our season right now. Saying, God, I appreciate, I'm grateful for what I have now. Yeah, we got to wait with gratefulness. And then it will happen much quicker than we think. Amen. And here's a piece of advice. Enjoy every season that you are in. I get it. I hear it. I know that there are people who, you know, in, in their heart, they, they, they want perhaps a, a, a spouse or to be in a relationship. I get it. I totally understand the desire. It is a good desire, biblical desire. But enjoy your singleness. You know, coming from someone who is married and has a child, enjoy your singleness. <laughs> Not that I don't love my son or my wife. I have to clarify that. But, but enjoy that singleness season because there's so much that you can do. And while at the same time, we are wasting our time complaining and saying, God, why hasn't it happened yet? When you can take advantage of your season right now and say, God, what do you want me to do as I am right now in my current season? Amen. And this is a, a last verse I want to read, Psalms 40, verse 1. The last one, we'll, we'll close our, our, our preaching today. So Psalms 40, verse 1, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. Notice something. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. There's not a, a comma there. There's a, a semicolon, and that's important. This is important to understand. Every time we see a semicolon, it's a connection, a conjunction of two sentences. And what it's truly saying here is that the equivalent of waiting patiently for the Lord is to be praying. To be saying, God, you're hearing my cry. That's what it truly means to be patient. And guess what? While we wait, God inclines in his ears and says, and says what, what do you want of me? As you are building and, and doing that kava, as you are twisting and, and braiding that rope, God is saying, now that you trust in me, I'm inclining my ear. What do you want? Ask of it from me. Do not stop praying. Like the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, it says, uh, rejoice always. And also it says... Uh, it, it says rejoice always. And, 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 and this is something that's important that, that I want us to focus on. While we are waiting, we are rejoicing on the Lord. And then it says pray continuously. Rejoice always. Pray continuously. 
If there's anything that you can do in your life as a Christian is those two things. Rejoice always and pray continuously. And you'll see the Lord answer your life. Amen. So I want us to, to finish off today. What, what I want us to do is I want us to all stand up on our feet. And I want you to, to join me in closing your, your eyes as this prepares us for, for receiving from the Lord. Welcome back. We hope this message impacted and touched your life. If God spoke to you through the message or you received Jesus, message us on WhatsApp or email us. We would love to hear from you. Don't forget to join us for service every Sunday at 11 a.m. and Fridays at 7.30 p.m. Have a blessed week.